Steve, after all these years on TV and a variety of TV stations, we congratulate you on a short retirement, I hope. What are some of the highlights of your career in talking to Chicago culinary superstars? Boy, it has been such a roller coaster from, I just posted this morning on my website, some old video I had from January, 2000, uh, talking to Charlie Trotter. You know, he was a co-host of a show I did and we had 30 of the city's best chefs and we're talking La Francais and Vincent Dell. And now the last year or so, I've been doing stories about people who've pivoted to fried chicken sandwiches in ghost kitchens and trying to make a, a go of it um, by selling, you know, out of the back of somebody's truck, it looks like. So it's, it's a, been a big change, to be honest with you. Um, I've seen Chicago go through this amazing culinary curve, you know, the uh, lineas of the world and the motos and uh, some of the best restaurants in the world. And now Chicago is just finding a way to, to stay afloat, really to stay alive. And, uh, it, but it, uh, at the end of the day, it's been fantastic just getting to talk to all the people who are so passionate about what they do, because these are the kind of people who are not doing it because it's a job. They do it because they love it. They do it because they want to be around food and hospitality and they want to feed people. And that's their disposition. And they just, uh, I, I think they make Chicago a great place to live. And so I'm not leaving the business altogether. I mean, I'm stepping down from ABC7, of course, but I'm not really going anywhere. I'm still producing stories. I still want to be around those people. By the way, I saw the uh, the feature with you and Charlie Trotter. I knew Charlie, he, I wouldn't be so presumptuous to say he was a friend of mine, but his father was a great jazz trumpet player. So uh, the Trotter name, I knew it even before I heard of Charlie. And I ate at Charlie's place a number of times, never shy about his prices over there, uh, because you always had to get the corresponding glass of wine with every okay. single course. And also I, uh, I ponied up to sit in the kitchen uh, on a New Year's Eve. So it was not an inexpensive night at Charlie Trotter's. And I want to get back to the improvisational nature of Charlie Trotter and his father, too, in a couple of seconds. Steve, does Chicago rate with the other great culinary centers in the world? I'm thinking, you know, Paris and uh, New York and, and what have you. Is Chicago world class? Because sometimes I think we are awfully hard on ourselves as a second city. We are. Uh, we have that second city mentality. And I, I don't think we're ever going to be like a, a New York or a Hong Kong uh, or a London. Those are just enormous cities with just vast populations. But in terms of food options, I think we're a world class city. I think we offer something for everybody. We just don't have it in multitudes. Right. We have one Rick Bayless. We have one Topo Le Bampo in Frontera. We have uh, one Alinea that really is that kind of that feather in the cap, which what Trotter was 20 years ago. Um, we don't have a ton of those places, but we have something for everybody. I think we have high end, low end, middle. We certainly have more ethnic food, immigrant food, um, as, as much as any city in, in America, even like a place like Toronto, which I think has incredible ethnic eating. Um, I think we've got something for everybody here, but we don't have the numbers, the sheer numbers that you'd find in those other world class cities like Paris. Um, with just, you know, 10, 15 million people. Uh, Steve Dolinsky is here. He retired or took a break from ABC7 after 17 years. We refer to the Charlie Trotter interview. That was on CLTV. Now, you were not strictly a critic, obviously, but still, you were hugely influential. And I'm going to pose this next question delicately. In all your years covering restaurants, you know, high restaurants, lowbrow restaurants, everything in between, I shouldn't say lowbrow, everything from food trucks to Charlie Trotters. Did anybody overtly ever try to bribe you or how did you maintain objectivity uh, throughout your career? Because people could spot you when you uh, came into their restaurant, obviously you were not like Phil Vitell, who never even had his picture published in the Tribune until very right. uh, towards the end of his career. How did, how did you stave off the obvious bribes that I'm sure came your way? Well, and just to be clear, <laughs> Uh, there weren't that many bribes. Just to be clear, I'm not, I don't consider myself a restaurant critic. I wasn't right. going in anonymously to assess the service, the food, you know, the whole thing and, and go there multiple times like a restaurant critic would. I was a food reporter looking for interesting stories, interesting dishes, and to then to go back with a camera and tell the story of that dish or how it's made or where it comes from. So, um, but certainly restaurants would you would recognize me and they'd, you know, they want me to come back in and do something about their grandmother's pasta dish that they were doing. And so sure, an extra dessert would show up at the table more than once. Um, 
<laughs> that's not going to buy me yeah, to, to, to come back to a place and do a story on it. Um, I think it's more about hospitality. They, they figured we've got somebody in the restaurant who's in the industry, um, who's well known. Um, he's got a good palate, a respected palate. He's eaten around the world. Um, I want him to try this. I, I think he should. He didn't order this. I want him to try that. Um, a gift last night, I got a gift from the kitchen. I was at a Korean place. They sent out two extra vegetarian sides for me to try because I didn't order those. And I was with five other people. So, and we were sitting outside, by the way. So I, I, I wouldn't call it a bribe. I would just call it more of a, a gentle welcome to the, the business. And we, you know, we may not get you back here again. And so we want to make sure you try this. But I never felt like it was, we're giving this to you so that you will come back and do a story about us. Well, I've asked any reporter, including your colleague, your uh, buddy, uh, Chuck Gowdy, you know, who covers uh, crime and uh, the outfit. And I asked, you know, in all your years of reporting, anybody try to lay the heavy hand on you? And he said only a couple times guys were pretty oblique about it, but still I could feel the pressure. I imagine anybody who's on TV and a person of influence, especially you, uh, you know, because you essentially a report, even though you're not a critic and I get it, but I'm sure they were foisting the best of their menu on you constantly. I would imagine you had trouble getting out of some uh, restaurants from time to time just because they kept wanting to bring you more and more to sample. Yeah, the term in the industry is getting crushed. So you say like, you know, on, in, on Instagram, you know, I got crushed tonight. It's because I went in and I ordered two things and I got six things or seven things. And yeah, they want to just, you know, abodanza. They want to blow you away. They want to put everything out there for you to try. And it's not always pleasant. You know, you think, oh, that sounds great. Oh, they're going to send me all this great food. And I'm not going to have to pay for it. No, I, I didn't. I didn't have the intention of eating that much food. I didn't want to eat that much food. I don't want to try the duck in the reduced, you know, Bordelais. I don't want to try the extra short rib. Um, I just wanted to have some pasta and a salad and a glass of wine. So it's not always welcome. And of course, as a guest in someone's home or in their kitchen or in their restaurant, you don't want to be impolite and say no. Um, so you accept it and you take, you know, some bites and <laughs> do the best you can. But um, I, yeah, I, that happened a couple of times. Steve, did you, um, you know, that's been a very difficult year, obviously, for the restaurant and the bar business in Chicago and I imagine worldwide as well. What do you think the future of this uh, business is? And, you know, will we ever go back to the old days, the old times where people could be shoulder to shoulder and table to table? Or is this, uh, are the new protocols here to stay even after we're all vaccinated? I think it's going to be a mix. I think we're going to get close to what you just described, the shoulder to shoulder. But I think that'll come with some caveats. Like there will be people, maybe the servers wearing masks. But I think you'll see people, we will, I just had dinner last night with a friend of mine who's a doctor. And he said, yeah, we're going to get back to normal. We're going to get back to a place where we're going to be, everybody's going to feel confident we're going to have yes there will be variants but most of the population will be vaccinated and you're going to be able to go to a restaurant and go to a concert and we will see those days again now in terms of when that's the you know the sixty four thousand dollar question um i think you're going to see uh, from what i've understood later this year um definitely by the fall uh you might even see some events planned in the city um, I am trying to plan a pizza event uh, open to the public in October, in early October. So we're, you know, fingers crossed. We think that fall will be possible. But in terms of indoor dining, full restaurants packed to the gills, probably not um, three, three deep at the bar. But I think you're going to see, you'll see a reduced capacity issue, but you will definitely not see the six feet apart with everybody wearing masks. I think you'll no. see a more normal um, but it'll be a little modified from what we remember maybe a year and a half ago. Steve, what were the biggest surprises? We've mentioned the names that everybody knows, uh, Bayless and Trotter and others in the restaurants, the Highline superstar restaurants. What were your biggest surprises in the last two decades of covering food in the city? I think all of the, well, two things. One is just the talented um, the immigrant population that comes to Chicago and puts it all on the line and opens a little place in a strip mall and is cooking the food of their childhood, basically, that their mother or father cooked for them. And, you know, going to a, like, this is going to Rogers Park or going to Avondale or going to just any neighborhood in Chicago, Pilsen, you know, and you, you stumble across some little joint that's making tacos or carnitas or Afghani rice dishes. That was always so surprising that that continued to happen in Chicago. The other surprise was, 
chefs who went through the sort of went through the training, went through the, they did the culinary school and they did a stage or an internship and they worked their way up. And then their dream was to go to the coast, you know, go to San Francisco or go to New York City, and work in a big kitchen. And then they realized they had enough of it and they can't afford to do their own place. They can't even afford to live in a one bedroom apartment. And so they come back to Chicago or they end up visiting Chicago for work, like a guy like Stephen Galanders at SKY in Pilsen. He wanted to go to Los Angeles with his wife and open a place. They decided, you know what? We liked working with Let Us Entertain You. They're giving us a kitchen to work with for free. We're going to open our own place here in Pilsen and make a go of it in Chicago. And that's what makes the city richer and, and I think more interesting in terms of food as well, because these talented young chefs who decide I'm going to put roots down here in Chicago uh, and make my neighborhood a better place and really invest in the neighborhood. That was really surprising because I always thought like in the early 90s, mid 90s, and Charter and I were talking on that show, like everybody wants to go to the coast. Everybody wants to go to New York and make their way. And now I think people realize, you know, and listen, the coasts have their own problems too, not just financial, but there's hurricanes and there's fires and there's floods. And uh, we don't really have that to worry about so much in Chicago. So I think that's also a benefit for us, the natural disaster uh, conundrum. Huh. I, uh, I admired Charlie Trotter. I admired his dad as a musician, obviously a great trumpet player, but you could tell the improvisational genius of Charlie Trotter. And the couple of times that I, I was at his restaurant a number of times, but I sat twice in his kitchen and I would not have wanted to work for Charlie Trotter because he seemed to be, you know, brutal with his staff in that kitchen. Now, you know, and it, maybe some of it's an act. You see these guys on TV that are screaming and yelling. That's just, uh, I assume they're all posing. But uh, with Charlie Trotter, he made his thoughts known in no uncertain terms. It was interesting to watch him work. Yeah, and you know, he was really the pioneer in terms of letting guests into the kitchen. That kitchen table experience was definitely a Trotter signature. I mean, he was way ahead of his time in terms of yeah. the way he thought about ingredients and importing ingredients and, and pr presenting them on the plate, very much improvisational. I mean, he was his, the theme music to his uh, series on PBS, I think was a jazz theme. Yeah. His yeah. whole thing was about improvising as he went. But yeah, I saw him a couple of times um, when we were shooting video in the kitchen and he wouldn't necessarily yell. He would just be very stern and direct <laughs> with someone. And that was almost as bad for a young, you know, 21, 22 year old uh, cook trying to make their way and just not mess up the, uh, the basil leaves. Uh, but, you know, just saying, Mr. Davidson, is that really how you're going to serve that on the plate kind of a thing? Um, you got the sense that uh, they didn't do that twice. Uh, Steve, you mentioned pizza. What is the name again? I thought it was a terrific book. Uh, give us the title of your pizza book that came out a year or two ago. Uh, pizza City USA, 101 Reasons Why Chicago is America's Greatest Pizza Town. And uh, the next book is coming out in September, same publisher here at Northwestern University, um, The Ultimate Chicago Pizza Guide, A History of Squares and Slices in the Windy City. And this is really much more of a deep dive into the history of some of the old school places in Chicago. And it's more of a city focused book with one chapter on the suburban stars. But really, I wanted to offer a book that people come to Chicago for three or four days and really want to just get into the meat of it. And they're not going to necessarily drive to Lincolnshire if they're staying downtown. So I wanted to give people like that a guide to kind of easy, it's a way to find the, the good places to eat. And if you wanted to just have a slice, you know, there's a chapter just on slices, yeah. places that offer pizza by the slice. So it's, it's going to come out in late September. And finally, Steve, I admire the uh, portrait over your left shoulder who is that and who painted it? That's a great question. Um, we went to dinner one night uh, many years ago at uh, Hai Yen on Argyle Street for Vietnamese food. And they had a very similar painting like that, but it was more um, uh, horizontal instead of uh, vertical like this one is. And I said, we love, my wife and I said, we love that painting. Um, who's the artist? And then she said, oh, it's a person I know back in Vietnam. I could commission a piece for you. And about four or five months later, we happened to be in for dinner and this was rolled up uh, in a corner for us uh, to take home and frame. They That's nice. Literally, they commissioned a painting for us. It's from Vietnam. I don't know the artist's name, but uh, yeah, it's a beautiful picture, right? Well, Steve Delinsky, I look forward to your next project. I, I loved watching you on ABC7, but there's a beginning, a middle, and an end to everything, especially in this business. So I'll wait and see where you land next, but I'll Get the book when it comes out, and I appreciate your time this afternoon. Thanks so much, John. Great to talk to you.